Hi, and welcome to Imperfect Utopias, based out of the UCL Global Governance Institute. This is a podcast about the challenges facing humanity and possible global responses. If you're new to the show and you want to get a list of our favourite books, other resources, listen to past shows and to join our community, go to ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance. Today we're in conversation with Jordan Hall. Jordan is the executive chair and co-founder of Neurohacker Collective, a company that makes groundbreaking products for health and well-being through complex systems science. Mr. Hall is in his 17th year building disruptive technologies. His previous positions include crafting strategy and product for mp3.com, then at InterVU, which was later acquired by Akamai, and then finally in 2000, launching and leading the online digital video revolution as founder and CEO of DivX. For more information on Jordan Hall, please refer to the links provided in the description, and we hope you enjoyed this episode of Imperfect Utopias. Look, I want to say thank you so much for for speaking with me. Really appreciate it. Um, My pleasure. It's, as I said in the email, I'm trying to really branch out in a slightly more imaginative direction, if you will. I don't know if you engage much with academics. Not really, actually. I, I don't recall the last time, let me think. Really? Been a long time. <laughs> yeah, 15, 20 years. Oh, wow. Goodness. Oh, well, I, I feel very uh, privileged. Um, you were at the Santa Fe Institute, though, right? Yes. And um, in that context, there, it's funny. Like, it doesn't feel like academics in that context because everybody's got their, um, their discipline. They leave it at the door. Uh, but yes, in a few cases, I've actually felt like there's been a bit of a feeling of, of uh, academia there, particularly a particular event we did on big history. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think perhaps, you know, ac- academia, academics, in a way, they are part of the problem. I hope they might also be part of the solution. And I think one of the key challenges which I'm currently facing is just how do we bridge these two worlds? I suppose the world of the paradigmatic mind, as you might put it, to the, the transdisciplinary mind um, and its very early stages. I'm hoping perhaps my students are going to help me out on that one a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, there's, there's some some very interesting moves that could be done there in terms of, um, yeah, maybe we can hold that as a, the, as a case study of the oh, difference the between the problem and the solution. Absolutely, that'll be great. So, um, yeah, I hope perhaps this might be the start of more conversations. We'll see how, how this develops. Uh, how long do we have roughly, just so I, I know not to try I, your patience? I, I believe we committed to 90 minutes. Okay, wonderful. That's fantastic. Well, so I, I suppose it, what would be helpful first is, uh, before we perhaps get into the, 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 uh, the really tough questions, as you, as you said, is it would be wonderful if you could just perhaps give us a sense of the lay of the land here. I mean, you have said elsewhere that we are in a situation that is extremely challenging. Um, could you help us focus our minds and what are your chief concerns perhaps particularly drawing on the situational assessment from this year and putting, putting these challenges in a, in a global context? Sure. Um, yeah, let's see if we can take this step by step, almost uh, zooming in by zooming out. So if you, if you take a given problem that happens to be ready at hand, uh, it might be, as you mentioned, for example, some of the challenges that an individual might experience in their journey through uh, academia. And for that matter, we can take it all the way through, in their journey through education. It might be the problems that an individual encounters if they find themselves uh, rushed to the emergency room um, or having to go to the DMV or go to the TSA or paying their taxes or voting in elections or noticing the uh, an increase in trash in their neighborhood or dot, dot, dot. And you can sort of do that. And there's almost two moves in association with any one of those problems. Um, Sometimes there's a way to truly respond to the problem um, at, let's call it at the, at the tactical level or at the level that it is at. So uh, to, to echo um, Jordan Peterson, um, if your room is not clean, 
then clean your room. <laughs> um, and sometimes it is as simple as that. We can also echo uh, Admiral McRaven, which is if your bed is not made, then make your bed. And it's more or less the same sentiment. Um, in the confines of your own house where you perhaps have the capacity to respond to the, the entropy of life, um, you can keep a tidy house, you can keep a nice garden, right? This is sort of thing people are familiar with. Um, but sometimes the, the nature of the problem is uh, deeper or broader than what appears to be ready at hand. So um, you think of the good, well, a simple example is the problem of, say, being interfacing with the TSA. And you know, so you, you may be standing there in line noticing about 15 things that would make everything better. Um, but where you are, the scale that you are at, uh, you are not empowered to be able to respond to the problems at hand. Um, and in fact, what you notice if you contemplate it is that the process whereby you would be able to respond is in fact uh, very complicated. I mean, imagine what it would take to be able to shift the, uh, the way that even your local TSA at the airport that is in your town behaves. And honestly, I have the slightest idea what that uh, Byzantine labyrinth of bureaucracy might look like. What do you, <laughs> you write a letter to your congressman? Is there some kind of website you can send uh, complaints to? It seems rather obscure, actually. Um, so so the, the, the level of response, particularly in, in this case, obviously, in, in the human domain, uh, can oftentimes take the response out of your hands. And so you have to be thinking about responding now at a larger level. In this case, you've invoked some level of system, mm-hmm. whether it's a, a regulatory system or, or a, uh, some kind of bureaucratic structure, or as I think you and I will probably talk about some sort of governance system, uh, this is now beyond the scope of an individual. And, of course, we can find these also nested. So there's the, a neighborhood scale um, or a homeowner scale or even an apartment scale, and then it goes up bigger. Village scale, town scale, city scale, nation state scale, global scale. And each one, of course, is further away from the agency of the individual. But we don't have to do it strictly at the human level. We could also do it at the level of um, more natural systems. So if I... Notice that my um, lawn is dry. Uh, I can water it, and that's fine, and that can solve that problem for a moment. But if my lawn is dry because climate change is causing rainfall to be low, um, then I might find myself in a circumstance where my local agency is inadequate. Um, the, the local aquifer or source of water might, in fact, be drying up. So I've got two different things going on the ability to use the human system of piped water is vulnerable to the complex natural context that it finds itself in. So the problem I'm seeing right in front of me is actually connected to something that is vastly larger. So this is maybe the the, the simple frame, is to be able to notice that you can have problems that are at different levels of scale that require capacities to respond to themselves at different levels of scale. All right, so now we've got the second. So that's the first move. That's like the first conceptual piece. The second second conceptual piece is how we humans can go about designing ways of responding at different levels of scale. And this, I would say, is really the crux of the matter. Um, my, My work has led me to the proposition that there has been more or less since the dawn of agricultural civilization, one fundamental toolkit, as a toolkit, of course, it could give rise to a very large number of different um, expressions. The one fundamental toolkit that human beings use to design approaches to problems that are larger than human scale. Uh, And I've been calling this game A. So there's a the, the metaphor of game is to, to bring to consciousness the notion that this is a very much a human level thing. This is not baked into, uh, uh, it is not obligate in reality. It is a way that humans have gone about trying to solve problems. And therefore, we could, in principle, at least choose an alternative. And in fact, in the past, we have. Um, and then A, game A, which is to point out that it's one of potentially many. And so, so here I have to broaden our conceptual toolkit. Is this a, 
a good pace and a good, good approach. Do this is feel like we're going the right way? Yes, this is helpful. Yes, thank you, Jordan. Yeah. Okay. So here, what I want to do is I just want to to invoke the 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 Kinevin framework from uh, Dave Snowden, um, spelled C N Y F E N, I think, or F I N. I forgot. Okay. Um, it's pronounced Kinevin, but it's Welsh, so it's spelled Cinefin. Um, I'm saying that just so that somebody can look it up on their own, but Dave Snowden is the originator. And the, and the key distinction here is a, an ontological distinction between a complex system and a complicated system. Um, and the, the distinction has to do with a, a number of characteristics, but I'll name two that I think more or less... Uh, make the distinction clear. Um, in, a, in a complex system, what you have is something that has many, many different nested levels of scale, all the way down, by the way, to the quantum level and all the way up to the cosmic level of the entire universe, but nested in many, many levels. So molecules nesting into uh, cells, nesting into tissues, nesting into organs, nesting into bodies, nesting into groups nesting into social structures, et cetera, et cetera, um, where causation can move up and down the levels of scale. And so cells can have upward causation on tissues, but organs can have downward causation on cells. Um, and with sort of characteristics of complexity, like sensitive dependence on initial conditions and um, poised states, so that it can be that tiny, tiny movements at a micro level can give rise to large movements at the at a more macro level. You know, one snowflake causes an avalanche, um, and all right. So that's one piece. And then the other piece is that the space of possibility, the the uh, the quality of what can happen at each of these levels of scale is in fact evolving. So what that means is that. Um, well, let me get back to that with the, the, with, the, with the opposite, and then we can, come, we can kind of close. Is that kind so, of the idea of emergent properties? Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. So I've got a, um, a model. If I tried to model a complex system, um, I'm never going to be done because something might emerge, some new thing or some new characteristic. And if I have a, um, a dice, a six-sided dice, I can model that very easily, right? There's six sides, there's... Uh, one, one, two, three, four, five, six vertices and I guess 12 edges or something like that. That's it. That's the whole thing. I've got the whole thing modeled. But if there was some way that when I were to throw the dice, it could magically transform into an eight-sided dice, well, my model is going to have to include that possibility. And if it could become a 20-sided dice or a 100-sided dice, then I have to actually change the model. And the whole point is that in complex systems, there is no point at which I can ever know that my model is going to be complete. In fact, it's never complete. It is ontologically incomplete. And that's the essence of it, right? So we have many, many different nested levels of scale with both upward and downward causation. And we have an ontological incompleteness to any possible model, the possibility of their novelty at any one of these levels of scale. It's complexity. Um, complicatedness, by contrast, is, is much simpler. Um, it is finite. It is bounded. Uh, to give sort of a very easy example, if I have the motion of a of a pendulum, and I'm really just focusing on it in the, in its complicated sense, because obviously it's a it's a real phenomenon in nature, so it's actually complex. But if I think of it just as a pendulum, I really only have uh, two characteristics that matter. One characteristic is the direction that it's swinging at a given moment in time. Uh, and the other characteristic is its momentum at any given moment in time, and I can more or less model this very simply, which is to say that when the pendulum is um, at the top of its arc on either side, its momentum has reached its minimum and the direction is reversing. So I can say that the direction is, goes from minus one on the top left to plus one on the top right and passes through zero at the bottom. And the momentum goes from zero at the top left to the top right and passes through plus one and minus one as it goes back and forth left to right at the bottom. Um, now, if I put that on a graph with an x, y, I have a minus one plus one in direction and minus one plus one in 
momentum, and it turns out it defines a circle. And I'm done. Yeah. There's, a, there's a way of saying, I'm done. The model is complete. I, to the degree which I'm, I'm taking a look at this piece of reality as just this, these pieces, right? These four characteristics are all that I care about. Then I have constructed a complete model. And that's the essence of a complicated system, is that you're endeavoring to abstract from complex reality some finite state that can have a complete, and by the way, fixed, unchanging model, right? So those, that's the, the, like the, the, the essence. So you've got complex, you've got complicated. Okay, um, yeah. Now, in Dave's system, he actually has complex and chaotic on the left side and complicated and simple on the right side. But as far as I can tell, those are, are epistemological boundaries, which is to say that a, a simple system is one that is within the intelligence capacity of the agent it's dealing with. So the pendulum is simple, whereas the, uh, the workings of a, uh, you know, a digital computer might be you no know, one person or any group of people might be able to really understand exactly what's going on. Um, but it is nonetheless actually finite and about it. Right? So that's sort of the distinction between simple and complicated. Yeah. We'll ignore that. We'll just work with complicated and complex. All right. Sure. So the proposition is that uh, humans, when we are endeavoring to do design, when we're trying to create something to respond to the world, we're building tools of which culture, by the way, is the, uh, a tool. I need to make that point that culture is possibly the er tool and all tools are part of culture. We are engaging in complicatedness. We are making a move. We are endeavoring to abstract some uh, finite boundary to the complex environment. And then we are trying to set up some kind of rules base on how to go about operating uh, either in or with that tool. And so, you look at any bureaucracy, any institution of any construct, and there is a, uh, the humanness to it is of that sort. It is complicated. Now, again, it's very important to recognize that all complicated systems are uh, intrinsically and inevitably actually complex. So this, of course, is the point of the problem we run into. Uh, and when we take our, we create our rules of how people are going to be supposed to behave, we're also dealing with the actual complexity of real human behavior. Right. Um, and so, so this then begins the process. So what we have is, is are we good? Do you have any questions? Yeah, perhaps I'll just, just um, to perhaps restate what you're saying uh, to make sure that I've understood and perhaps put it in a context um, or which my students would understand as well. So and the initial point on the, the water aquifer, I mean, essentially what you're saying is that um, these problems are at a level of complexity that it limits our ability to be effective, to act effectively, to really understand the consequences of our actions as well, um, because of the, the the magnitude or scale of the the complexity which, say, water scarcity presents. Um, and I suppose the, the so would that be a correct interpretation? Well, that's one of three problems. Right. Right. So that's a good one. So what we can say is there's a relationship between the amount of complexity that a given complicated system can handle, yes. uh, can, can effectively bound, um, and the amount of complexity that it is, in fact, faced with. So if you have a, a, a complicated system that can handle the complexity of the environment that, that it's dealing with, by the way, for the moment, this is, a, this is problem number two, yeah. <laughs> uh, then, yeah. then it can be perceived as a well-functioning system. Yes. Uh, but can I just ask Jordan on that point then? So if we think about the suite of transboundary challenges, we might say global catastrophic risks, would you, can we differentiate between sort of complex and super complex or even complicated and complex? For instance, nuclear weapons, you do have clear lines of attribution of responsibility or potentially you have some attribution of responsibility that can be clearly identified. Um, the consequences are direct. Um, one can it, one understands how that causal process works out it, it, it is catastrophic and we might compare that to say biodiversity where attribution of responsibility is incredibly diffuse where often it's the indirect consequences of very decentralized activity that leads to these kind of, to, to exacerbation of biodiversity loss so have the problems got more complex got harder or am, am I actually have they always been? complex and complicated is just not a, it never sure. so, a game plan. 
Yeah, so here, let's this, this, this just like be precise, which by the way, I would say is one of the, the ways that academia can be helpful. So let's be precise. Um, the distinction I was making between complicated and complex was ontological in character. We can then expand that with an epistemological dimension. And here we can talk about degrees of complexity. Um, so that there's a, and we can actually, if we'd like to measure it in terms of bits of actual information. So a, um, what are those things called? A day fly. What do they, what do they call There's a good term for them. Mayfly? Anyway. Yeah. Mayfly? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or these, these small worms where the total length of its DNA strand is like 120 nucleotides. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> where we can actually identify every single cell. Um, it's very, it, it is, it is complex in the ontological sense, but the amount of complexity is well, at this point small enough that we actually can hold it more or less. Um, it's within the boundaries of our uh, computational capacity. So we can build a complicated model that is able to have enough uh, information processing capacity to bound the complexity of this particular underlying system. So there's a, uh, a very important dynamic of the epistemological relationship. So in this case, yes, there is uh, quite a difference between mutually assured destruction in a two-state actor problem domain, which is, actually, as you said, a relatively simple complex domain. Right? There's not a whole lot of different uh, moves to the, to the model that I have to create, and my model can be pretty effective. It still has fundamental ontological challenges that we'll get to in a moment, but uh, at least at the level of being a well-functioning model, it works okay. Um, but if I, as you say, if I expand out to some other more, more complex system or system that has more complexity to it, um, to go with climate as an example, but we find ourselves noticing that even our best models uh, clear, clear aren't even close to being able to hold the amount of complexity that the, they would need to be able to hold to actually bound the system within certain degrees. Um, now, here I also feel like it's useful to invoke uh, Nassim Taleb and the idea of black swans. So one of the problems that we run into at the epistemological ontological boundary is that whenever I have a, a, a complicated model that has enough informational capacity to, to bound or to well model a complex system, um, it's always going to ultimately still be more or less. Um, so there's always going to be some rounding, some quantitization of, of the analog reality that drops the, you know, the, the, the fifth, the ninth, the 30,000th digit past the decimal point. Right. And, and broadly speaking, what we humans say is, that, well, that rounding error is okay. We can, it's all right to round off at the edge. I should say, by the way, that this goes all the way back to calculus. If, you, if you're familiar with Leibniz, the notion of how mm -hmm. calculus actually solves the problem of how do you measure the area under a curve is through the, uh, the method of the limit as X approaches infinity, which is to say that we're going to reduce the error to what he called the infinitesimal, and then we're going to, we're going to round off. So our mathematics um, in, impl explicitly uh, includes this notion of rounding off. And of course, any model must, because reality, complex reality, is infinite in its uh, uh, possibility. Right. So, so what we find ourselves with is one of the problems we run into. So let's say our first order problem is, do we have at all enough computational capacity to bound the complex system that we're observing inside a model that can actually give us any kind of predictability at all? Okay, yes or no? Let's just go for the moment and say yes. Well then, second order problem is that we're going to be running up against black swans, which is very, very low probability events that nonetheless have very large magnitude consequences so that our, uh, our model doesn't include them. And most of the time, that's fine, but some of the time, that's catastrophic. Right? So that's one of the challenges that actually lives at the epistemological ontological boundary and is irreducible, meaning that anytime you endeavor to manage a complex system using a complicated model or framework, um, black swans are going to be part of, what of your life. Uh, Okay, so that's one. So then we have now three more problems. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can if I can get them. 
so slowly enough so that they land uh, cleanly. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So uh, one, I would I'll name the the tainter boundary named after the uh, anthropologist Joseph Tainter, who was examining the collapse of what he called complex societies. Um, uh, the next is the the Arc Heidi Smith boundary. Um, and then the third... Sorry, is, what was the second one there, Jordan? The second is the Arc Heidi Smith. Okay. A-R-C hyphen H-I-D-E-Y-S-M-I-T-H. These are, again, the individuals who first brought it to my awareness, by the way. Right. Yeah, I've not, I've not heard of that one. Uh, I can imagine. Uh, I don't know that many people have. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. It's not just my ignorance, yeah. Uh, and the third, I'm just going to flag as the... Uh, as a sort of Heisenberg uncertainty problem. Um, there's, I don't know that anybody has stated this well. By the way, they, they probably have. It's just I'm not familiar with it. But we'll get there last. Okay. So in, in the tainter boundary, what we, uh, we might observe is a very, very specific set of uh, relationships between the underlying complex reality of nature and the, the dynamics of complicatedness as it responds to complex nature in time. Um, and I don't want to go into a whole lot of detail there just yet, because it's a bit of a long story, and I've spoken about it a couple of different times. But I, I think what you're saying, what you're suggesting is that uh, essentially, ultimately, the, the complex conditions will overwhelm system designs that respond to complicated design principles yeah, well, what, it, what happens is you get uh, two primary failure conditions that kind of co-create each other. Um, on, the, on the complex side, the complicated actuation, the capacity of your complicated system to abstract the complex environment destabilizes the homeostatic equilibrium of the complex environment. So you, you dump carbon, di- carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and destabilize the the complex system that you were assuming was relatively stable or or you extract all of the oil that's easy to get to. um, And the complex system isn't able to produce oil quickly enough. So there's a a mismatch between the regenerative capacity of the complex system and the extractive and or toxic capacity of the complicated system that leads to some kind of fragility and collapse on the complex side of the equation. So that's one side of it. And then on the other side, what you have is that um, as complicated systems um, respond to changing demands, they have a, a, a real challenge in becoming more complicated and therefore having a, a higher entropy, a higher carrying cost, and a uh, complexity creeps in in the in the gaps. So. If you sort of zoom in on, uh, you're, you sound like you're you're British. Have I am you, British. You, yes. <laughs> have, you, have you been to Heathrow recently? Yes. Uh, yes right. Uh, so, so Heathrow is an excellent example. And if you okay. take a look at Heathrow, what you notice is this characteristic of how hard it is to actually maintain a very complicated system in good working order over time. <laughs> Complexity yeah. kind of seeps in. Uh, dirt gathers in the corners that doesn't ever quite creep up. Um, oil lines break, uh, rain begins to you know, crack in the seams. And also, uh, every single time that we try to, to deal with a new problem that a complicated model wasn't quite well responding to, either because we didn't notice it or because something's actually changed, the, the effort of going back and re-engineering the complicated system all the way back down to its base is really, really hard. So we almost always add more complicatedness. So in, in America, we have a very simple example, which is we've got the Constitution, which is the sort of first order complicated system, which is, you know, can fit on 10 pages. And then you've got, you know, a, a modern, like the, what was it called? The, uh, the TPP, I think, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yeah. Something, something like 12,000 pages for a single treaty. And that's the idea, right? What happens is, is that 
that the complicated system, it cannot help but become simultaneously bloated in its own actuation and become corroded in its interior. And the, the energy cost, the cost of actually trying to maintain the bloated system and the increasing cost of trying to keep it working well puts pressures on the system on the complicated side, which can collapse on that side. Right? So it's so a habit you have, uh, Sorry, Jordan. I was just wondering, would you apply that then to, for instance, the United Nations, where yeah, you, sure. you, yeah, you see a lot of bloating, a lot of proliferation. You don't see a lot of organizations actually being decommissioned, for instance, when they no, no longer serve their purpose or being reconstituted, uh, fundamentally reconstituted. It's, it's broadly impossible for reasons having to do with cybernetic control theory. It has to do with the, you would need to have a, a complicated system. You would actually need to have a, a, a new system that was able to hold the totality of the United Nations in itself to be able to actually update or modify the United Nations um, with precision. So if you're trying to do it from inside the United Nations, by definition, you have a, an amount of complexity in the United Nations as a functioning system that is larger than the United Nations as a uh, computational, the, the, the intelligence of the UN is smaller than the complexity of the UN. So you're done, right? That you, by, by problem number one, you're already stuck. And so this will happen, by the way, generically across all possible relationships between complicated systems and complex systems. Right? That, is a, that is a statement about the nature of reality. Um, and so you get to a place where you've got the, uh, remember the deep water horizon, uh, the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Mm-hmm. And that kind of, that, that lives at the boundary between the complex collapse and the complicated collapse. Uh, as oil becomes harder and harder to get, you know, the, the extractive capacity of the complicated systems actually hold the complex system into more and more fragility. Um, the complicated system has to become more and more capacitant which means also more and more complicated, which makes it more and more fragile to failure conditions. And so the tainter, you know, tainter model then says, well, this is going to end badly. At some point, somewhere, one of these two sides ends up collapsing. Either your complicated system just kind of collapses on itself, like Rome, where even a small push of barbarian invasions finally just collapses the whole thing. Or the complex system reaches its... You can't pick any more fruit out of some piece of it, and you get a Mayan style collapse. Right. Right? So that's the tainter problem. Right? So, this is again, we're, we're trying to describe the fact that um, so long as human beings are endeavoring to use complicated solutions to navigate complex reality, we have a number of ca- categorical problems that are intrinsic to that dynamic. Yes. And the proposition is that that's, that's sort of the best way of describing. The, the, the thing we're trying to deal with. All right, so we so looked at number one, which is that um, you may run into a situation where you just don't have enough computational capacity to build a complicated system that can truly model and therefore bound to the complex environment you're dealing with. And even if you do, there's going to be black swans popping up uh, randomly. That's one. Two is the painter dynamic that we just talked about which is the relationship between the asymmetry of the extractive and or uh, toxic capacity of the complicated system to the regenerative capacity of the complex system and the becoming more complicated entropic uh, decline of the complicated system into bloat and or into uh, uh, corrosion on the interior. Okay. Yes, which very much feels like where we are today, of course. Yeah. Oh, it's all over the place. I had a wonderful opportunity when I came out to London to actually fly from JFK, no, sorry, from LAX to Heathrow and just <laughs> literally just wandered through the absurdity of a late stage <laughs> complicated system, <laughs> just yeah. begging for collapse. <laughs> yeah. um, I should mention, by the way, that historically, the way that we've dealt with this problem is, in fact, collapse. So, the way we've broadly sort of flushed the system of complicated <laughs> structures is we've gone ahead and collapsed. The Roman collapse, the Bronze Age collapse, uh, the, the middle, the Dark Age collapse that was precipitated by the Black Plague. And we've had, very, and of course, China historically has had these dynastic cycles where a dynasty emerges, rises, falls into corruption, and collapses very badly. Yes. And, and from, 
from which chaos rejuvenation actually occurs. The complicated systems really do go away. They uh, fall to some very low level. And then in a true state of just first chaos and then complexity, we reinvent new systems. So we move from Rome to Western civilization. So historically, that's how we've dealt with the problem. Um, I don't think it's too hard a move to point out that, that it's unlikely that global collapse at a Rome or Bronze Age scale in 2025 is a very good option for what we're no, doing. I mean, it's unbounded, as I think you're suggesting. Um, are you working with those kinds of timeframes? Yeah. Yeah, we're, right. definitely, we're definitely in the zone where a sort of a, a five to 15 year time frame for uh, some set of uh, cascade effects is entirely possible. I mean, we, if we t- just take a look back at 2008 and witness how the global financial system went through a massive convulsion that took truly heroic efforts on the part of effectively everybody on the planet and pushed and pushed risk almost everywhere they could stick it, um, just barely held on by its fingernails. Um, that's a good example. You know, starting, starting not too long ago, we entered into a point where the, the fragility of the total complicated system of the post-World War II order was reaching points of fragility and just sort of Every day, that fragility just continues to grow for, for just straightforward reasons. All right. So then you got the next problem. And this will not seem unfamiliar to you at all. Uh, this is the Archite Smith problem. And so here what we have is we have the, the human factor. So in the, in the tainter area, we were talking about more or less the direct relationship between complicated and complex and nature. In Archite Smith, what we're going to deal with is humans. And we, we notice is that any complicated system that we put in place becomes a niche for exploitation by some subset of the human beings that are contained by the complicated system. All right, so this becomes, if you're familiar with evolutionary theory, this becomes an actual example of what's called group selection. Right. Um, group selection is somewhat uh, controversial in, in uh, sort of store, standard order uh, biological evolution. But here we're talking about group selection as something happening within human society. Um, so what happens is in, we have a complicated system and that complicated system is finite and bounded, which means that there are going to be gaps. In fact, there's going to be gaps all over the place. And this creates a niche for defection. So within the Ark Smith model, we're more or less dealing with the problem of game theory. It's a game. And in the context of game theory, what we begin to see is that um, anytime a prisoner's dilemma style defection scenario shows up or any kind of tragedy of commons style defection scenario shows up, what we call a multipolar dilemma, um, game theory begins to apply and that there will be a niche for some group to figure out how to take advantage of the gap between the complicated and the complex to achieve local selective advantage in the context of the larger complicated system. And of course, this gives rise to things like policing. So, um, you know, to use just a very simple example, if the the basic problem is there's a group of of 10 of us and we're trying to carry a, a heavy log from point A to point B, and so all 10 of us carry the log and we just sort of put it on our shoulders. We even arrange by height. So it's actually relatively convenient. Um, there's a possibility that one of us could slack off, right? We have a multipolar problem. And if there's, if there's a reward for doing that, if there's something about maintaining energy to the advantage to your, that gives you a local selective advantage over everybody else. Like let's say the way the game works is we carry the log from point A to point B and then at point B, we engage in some kind of endurance test and whoever wins, wins the big prize, right? Mm-hmm. Well, immediately we see how the games can play out, right? There's going to be a, everyone's going to endeavor to slack off as much as they can get away with such that the primary task, the global task happens, the logs carry from point A to point B, but that they get local selective advantage for their smaller group, in this case, one, in the second task. And broadly speaking, what happens is, is this again is a, the general characteristic of complicatedness that 
the complexity of a human being, an actual discrete human, and by the way, I should say up to Dunbar limit human groups, yeah. um, has a capacity to find the niche. It can't help, actually. There's an evolutionary mandate that if there is a niche, that niche will be exploited. It'll be found, it'll be utilized because if I don't, then you will. Um, and this begins the process that in the Harkadi Smith model moves from what they call the wild to the domestic to the feral to again collapse. And the basic story here is that in the wild, there's a, a very Dunbar complexity based a human relationship to other humans. We, we come with a, a very strong relationship to nature. Could we draw some analogies to, say, Eleanor Ostrom's work on how to ma- how small communities manage the commons? And yep, absolutely. Right, exactly. Yes. And inside the Dunbar limit or inside a community that has, uh, can use those kinds of uh, human scale um, evolved capacities to do policing specifically, yes. then we have a capacity to manage commons. We can solve multipolar dilemmas. Uh, but as the scale of humans begins to go beyond that limit, you start running into having to use complicated systems, mostly bureaucracies, to endeavor to manage um, defection. Yes. And we have begun the process. Uh, and there were, can be many, many... And by the way, you can take a look at this in any civilization. So you look at the the origin, for example, of Rome and the extreme intensity of the origin of Rome. Their conflict with the Celts almost was existential. And so they had to develop, develop an extremely effective, uh, what's called asabiya by a, the Islamic scholar, um, even, hmm, I forgot his last name. Well, asabiya is the word. Okay. Uh, you, might, you might call it... Uh, teamwork or capacity to be on the same team Hmm. and first generation second generation again kind of like coming out of world war ii the guys who fought together in the foxholes and built real human levels of of why it's important not to defect on each other sticks around you can actually do some pretty good stuff with that Uh, to use the uh the recently debauched uh but almost perfect story up until the last season uh game of thrones (laughs) um You've got the Starks. You've got the the Night's Watch, right? Right on the border, metaphorically, literally at the wall between civilization and nature, where complex nature is constantly pushing back on human society. And every time local defection, any group tries to defect, um, it's quickly noticed and quickly policed. And so at the wall, in the Night's Watch, you have a wild-type human who's effectively using complexity in relationship with complexity. Then as you move further from the border and where nature is, is actually being held back successfully by your complicated social environment, people are no longer having to deal directly with nature every day. They're actually dealing with society as their primary niche. This is the key, right? It's the shift. When you move from nature as the human niche to society as the human niche, you're now on the Arcadi Smith model. Um, we're now at Winterfell, right? We're in the north. You still are close, and the, 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 the story of winter is coming still has traction, and defectors get punished. Remember the very first season where Ned Stark is saying, you know, as the king, yes, it feels bad to have to chop the head off of this poor guy who just ran from a scary thing, but them's the rules. And by the way, the king has to have his hand on the sword. Like, you've got to enforce the law directly. Like, this is good domesticated humans. This is well-functioning, complicated society where... We're still in the period where the complicated system is being enforced in good faith by the by most people, by and particularly by the leadership. But as you move further, I mean, what we're talking about also, I suppose, is is um, ethics, and uh, are we talking about sort of virtue ethics uh, and and sort of strong social norms? Right. We're, we're, yes, we're talking about the, the the relationship between the niche of society and the durability of virtue ethics in time. So this is the story of history, right? The story of Ned Stark exhibiting virtue and virtue showing up as successful humans in Winterfell. But when Ned Stark moves to King's Landing, his virtues become naivete and he gets his head chopped off. By the way, by an executioner, not by the king. 
<laughs> but the rules in King's Landing are, are now moving into the feral space where complex humans now begin to prey on each other because the niche is society, no longer nature. And the virtues of wild, the virtues even of domesticity become um, prey. They become something that other humans can choose to play on. And these, by the way, have to do with very, two very specific gaps. One gap has to do with the gap in communication, which we see constantly, meaning that if there's a, an opportunity for me to communicate in a way that you can't check perfectly the veracity of my communication, then there opens up a possibility for me to communicate in a fashion which ever so slightly advantages me over you. Um, the other, of course, is the gap um, with uh, objective reality. Uh, to the degree to which it's actually difficult to know what's actually going on, then there's a, a, a way for there to be, a uh, again, an opportunity to exploit it for my local advantage. So use climate change as a great example, a perfect example. Is there climate change? Is there? It, what, what's it look like? How's it working? What, what would happen if we did X, Y, or Z? Well, the reason why it's so hard for us to actually make any movement here is because of those two problems. On the one hand, it's possible for me to tell you a story, a really good narrative that gets you to make choices that may in fact benefit you, but more importantly, benefit me more. Hmm. And it's actually really, really hard to know. Complex nature is, is bounded. And so even if we tried really hard in good faith to know exactly what's going on, there's a gap. And so now, of course, the question is, well, what do I do with that gap? Do I, put, do I take the personal hit on myself? Do I, do I bear the risk of that gap? Or do I protect myself and let society, people who I don't even know, bear the risk on that gap? And again, the calculus of game theory is that even if for a while most people choose to take the hit themselves, they will ultimately begin to actually be ultimately selecting against themselves. They will become losers in the social game. They will not win political power. They will not win fame and wealth. And those who play the, play the social game correctly, they play game theory right, will begin to win. And so they will eventually begin to select against the, uh, uh, the dupes and the rubes who don't understand that once you've moved into social space, um, the game is different. Now, of course, again, historically, this has led to collapse. And the way we've solved this problem is we've had a nice big fat purge uh, and lots and lots of people die, uh, including, by the way, the ferals, who very quickly find themselves on the wrong side of a bad bet. So ferality is a great strategy in the beginning of a, a social expansion. You can actually become you know, a, a, a tyrant lineage like the Habsburgs, who lived off the uh, feudalism for generations. Um, but when uh, the, the collapse does finally come. Generally speaking, ferality has a very, very hard time because once you, once you find yourself having to navigate complex reality directly, uh, the water does not flow and you can't just go to the store and buy food, then you're right back to Dunbar-level human virtue uh, as, the, as the fundamental currency. Um, Connecting that to the Tater principle, I suppose also if, if we continue to play game A, uh, Ultimately, you're going to extinguish the playing field. Yes, that's right. So, so again, you can actually kind of you can see the Tainter principle as having its own characteristics, and the Archytas model of ha as having their own characteristics. But of course, they're both happening simultaneously. Right. So, uh, you've got now. Uh, if I use Heathrow as my example, I have the the difficulty of the increasing complicatedness of the global transportation network. Uh, I have the difficulty of the increasing complicatedness of what uh, of just managing a more and more complicated system that starts having more uh, places for entropy to show up. And then I have the difficulty of the fact that petty bureaucrats are petty bureaucrats, and there's very little possibility of policing them. And the mechanisms for police just add another layer of petty bureaucrats who eventually need to be policed, which creates more area for exploitation and or for entropy to show up. And so this is the problem. Um, and then we have the final problem. Uh, this is what I've been thinking, referring to as sort of the Heisenberg uncertainty problem. So just to make the reference, the point of Heisenberg uncertainty in physics is that uh, at certain levels of scale, you cannot decouple the consequences of the observer from the system. And so 
uh, physics in particular, but broadly speaking, science is premised on the capacity to separate the observer from the system. And so I can, I can look at the system and my impact on the system should be zero. Um, and what Heisenberg notices is that in physics, at least, um, when you get down to the very, very small, the capacity to observe, the capacity to perceive information from the system at all must actually have a not only non-zero, but oftentimes fundamental impact on the dynamics of the system. So if I try to measure the momentum of a quantum uh, phenomenon, I cannot measure its uh, location. And, and vice versa. So if I measure the momentum with high precision, I actually move my uncertainty of its location almost completely, and vice versa. Um, well, as it turns out, this principle is not just limited to quantum physics. It's actually universal in nature, but it just has to do with the relationship between the power of the agent and the strength of the system. And so if I am using... Uh, you know, photons to observe quantum phenomena, my photons are not going to move a, a mountain or a, uh, uh, even a small weight. You know, if I, so if, I, if I'm looking at a, a one gram weight with my eyeballs, the photons of light bouncing up that one gram weight, the power of my observation is relatively small compared to the strength or the, uh, the inertia of the system under observation, so I can more or less rule it out. This is almost like a black swan thing. But if I'm using nuclear bombs to probe that one gram <laughs> weight, then I vaporize the one gram weight, right? So it's just really a relationship between the two. Well, now just take this whole story that I've been telling. As we begin to try to deal with more and more compl complex systems that we're trying to, to deal with, you know, now we're trying to do with the whole global uh, climate, for example. Yes we find that we actually have to use more and more powerful, complicated capacities to both model them and then to control them and manage them. Um, but now the power of what we're using is non-zero in the context of the system that we're dealing with. And this gets us to an infinite regress uncertainty problem. So at a certain threshold, our complicated approach is actually creating ripples in the complex environment, which makes the environment harder to manage, which becomes a positive feedback loop in the direction of collapse. Does that make sense? Yes. I mean, it's a positive feedback loop in the direction of chaos, potentially, I suppose. Exactly. Unintended consequences. And, and cybernetics theory and control theory actually has lots and lots and lots of these kinds of things. You know, if you've got a, uh, uh, an airplane that's trying to fly and the, control stick the, the movement that you create generates um more effect than the state that you're able to measure then you'll get you'll get a very quick uh collapse it'll actually come out of control um and we'll see this by the way it's you know it's, it shows up in control theory more or less perfectly and so that's really interesting um, so once we move to a threshold which is where, where we are at um where we are dealing with a level of complexity that is either uh, outside of the bounds of our epistemological capacity to model it at all, which happens in some cases, um, or where the level of power necessary to be able to model and respond to it is actually showing up in the system itself, then we've once again reached the boundary conditions of Game A of the ability to use complicatedness to manage complexity. Okay, so, so think, that's it. No. That's yeah, so I, I was going to say, Jordan, I think you've done a fantastic job at set, setting up the problem, and and now I'm really worried. <laughs> and it seems that what you're suggesting is that we have to to actually handle the total complexity of the situation. You would have to be able to hold all three of these principles simultaneously. Anything less than that will likely lead to a collapse. I mean, I'm also interested as a political theorist that you don't really place so much emphasis on power on, say, internal corruption capture as much as really the, the, the daunting structural challenge that these super complex problems pose. Would that be a correct interpretation? 
Well, I would just say that the, the, all of those questions are real, but they're more or less captured as a subset of the first and the second. So, for example, corruption and capture uh, is going to be some variation on multipolar dilemmas that show up in the Arkady Smith model. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, bureaucratic, uh, like, like the problem that von Mises describes in terms of how command and control economies can't actually govern uh, economic systems. Yeah. More or less is either problem kind one, which is that the complexity of economies is larger than the control capacity of the complicated system that you can develop with a command and control economy. Or problem kind two, which is that as you build your command and control economy, you begin to notice that it, has, it becomes more and more and more complicated as it tries to actually continue to keep pace the complex environment and you run into a tainter style collapse so there you go okay great well as i said i think it's very helpful getting right down to the 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 foundational tectonic plates if you will of of the the challenges that we confront and i'm wondering then i suppose the obvious question is what are we going to do um and obviously we see i think a lot of denial in uh at least in in western culture around the gravity of the situation um at the time we see a lot of the young people mobilizing uh we we see efforts towards empowerment i think with say extinction rebellion and, and other organizations um what does a transition towards an effective governance response to this situation look like well, um, interestingly enough, we can actually state the what somewhat simply, but the how's a, a bit more challenging. Okay. Um, the what is that we must, in fact, dispense more or less entirely with endeavoring to manage complex systems with fundamentally with complicated approaches. Um, we still actually use complicated approaches quite a bit, but they have to be not the highest level in the stack. Uh, we have to actually find some way as humans to manage our complex environment and our complex humanity um, in a truly complex way, not in a complicated way. Now, this is a, one of those classic scenarios in science where the problem is actually well stated. The solution is a big fat question mark. Uh, so, Remember at the very beginning, I made the proposition, I'll say it again now that we've got a lot of water under the bridge, that the totality of the human toolkit, every single thing that we have done deliberately since the first tool, and certainly since the agricultural revolution, the dawn of, of agricultural and civilization on, on until now, have been from the game A toolkit which is to say from the toolkit based on the use of complicated systems to manage complex environments. So literally everything that we know on how to go about responding to uh, problems that are beyond the human scale won't work. So it's, this is kind of like the Arthur Conan Doyle scenario. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Now, I'll, I'll back up in a bit and kind of examine that spot, but let's assume for the moment that you're able to Look, not and say, okay, fair enough. We've eliminated all the things that can't possibly work. So we're left with something which, although very uh, challenging, it's the place we have to focus our time and energy. Yes. Um, so what I notice when I've had this conversation, and, and by the way, I've noticed it changing. So I actually more or less was a, beginning to have this conversation on the order of about, what is this, 2019? Seven years ago? Yes, I've seen some of your earlier videos on YouTube. Fascinating, yeah, on on governance design. Yeah, so more or less everything that I'm saying to you was at least somewhat clear seven years ago. And what I I found was that, hmm, yeah, let me actually say, yeah, there's three three general responses. Uh, as, as As you can imagine, the most common response was, I don't understand. (laughs) <laughs> um, and that's a very large amount of abstraction and conceptualization necessary to be able to tell the story that I just told you. And I don't know whether or not even yet it's particularly clearly presented that people who are listening are actually able to grasp it at a level that is, it feels 
quite real. Um, not just sort of intriguing, but quite real, you know, in, in the sense of, uh, um, you know, the, the law of gravity has a nice quite realness to it. And so that you're not likely to jump off a building. This is that sort of thing. You know, we're, if the proposition is we have to actually dispense with literally everything we've ever used in the dawn, since the dawn of civilization to solve our problems, then the argument needs to actually feel quite, quite, quite real to you. So the first problem is that very, very, very few people were receiving the argument and holding the, the complexity of the argument enough to be able to say, yep, that is right. That is a good description of reality and therefore the conclusion follows um so most people just sort of said some variation of eh maybe and i'd actually rather not deal with this so i'm going to do other stuff okay hmm. huh. um, and this is of course is common in, in almost every circumstance i mean if you're the the the, the conservative response of do what more or less has worked in the past. It's a very good rule of thumb. <clears throat> and so when somebody comes to you with something that's really hard to understand, and it implies that you definitely have to put down the tool that's worked very well for you in the past, as long as that tool is even vaguely likely to continue working, you'll just tell them to piss off. <laughs> yes. But of course, at some point, I suppose the risk, the risk of business as usual may actually outweigh the risk of radical transformative change. And this is what I've noticed over the past seven years is that right. more and more people have noticed that the tools that they've been using aren't working um, and that the tools that they look to use not only aren't working, but are in fact making things worse. And so their willingness to pursue just the, 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 the embodied sense of, wait a minute, yeah, you know what? I've actually been able to feel in myself how this tainter thing has been showing up over the past seven years or how this Archive Smith thing has been showing up over the past seven years. That's there's almost more of a concrete embodied uh, development. And so I'd say that where maybe one person in 10,000 seven years ago would nod their head. Now it's like one person in a hundred are more or less nodding their head. But I would imagine that anyone who's reading the headlines in the guardian on, you know, biodiversity collapse, sixth mass extinction. I mean, this is now penetrating the mainstream. Would, would you agree? Yes, and so let's get back to that in a second. Let me go okay, through the other sure. two, and then, and then we'll get. And that's a good place to go. Um, and, and I think we may be able to actually move the state of the art of the mainstream meaningfully forward on this point. So, so then you've got the second, which was almost everybody else. <laughs> so, the people who actually were able to hold all the complexity of the story, which, by the way, was very poorly told seven years ago, uh, and it's relatively poorly told still now because it's a hard thing to tell. Um, they would then realize the magnitude of what we're facing as a human family and their capacity to process grief became the gating item. So they would either literally just go offline like, Oh shit. Like this thing is not, there's no chance. We have got no chance. I'm, you know, devastated and no longer capable of participating. But some people, like some people just went offline. Mm -hmm. Other people went into delusion, meaning, you could actually see it. Uh, I got quite good at noticing how it happens at a physiological level. Like I could see the pupil dilate when they got, when it really, they could, they could understand what's happening. Their body would actually go into a fight or flight response and their prefrontal cortex would, would tell a soothing story that allowed them to move forward day to day. Um, and this, by the way, is very commonplace among more or less anybody who's at the edge of one of the primary risk areas. So, you know, the, and I think this is actually becoming much more mainstream, the story of if you truly, truly believe that we are on the precipice of catastrophic biosphere collapse, mm -hmm. how exactly do you go to your job in the morning as an air traffic controller? Absolutely. Right. And of course the problem is, well, shit, what else are you going to do? Um, what exactly can you do? So the only thing you can do is you go into denial. You don't actually fully live the thing that you see because well that's the only choice you got you've got no other way to go um and this makes sense right when, when our actuation capacity is so vastly overwhelmed by the scope of what it is that we perceive must be done we effectively put our head in the sand and this is an adaptive response that is not unreasonable i'm reminded of many conversations i have with colleagues very much along these lines sure absolutely no mm -hmm. question 
Yeah, I mean, and it actually doesn't have to be, even be that that enormous. You know, if, if you're having in academia, for example, because the emotional resilience of academics tends to be quite low. Um, if it's merely a threat, if, if, if the proposition is literally only that, um, well, it seems like your department may in fact have to go away. Um, that is enough to cause them a, a, a fight or flight response that goes into the, what's called the freeze response. Are you familiar with that construction? Yes. Yeah. Which is to say they go into freeze, which at a cognitive level becomes delusional and they'll just, their body will tell them, sorry, that's an unacceptable conclusion. And I will simply go on believing otherwise, regardless of what reason has to say. Um, so this is a, a major issue with academics is that academics, broadly speaking, don't have a lot of, uh, embodied experience with shit being real and harmful and scary so intelligence is intelligence is no match for the limbic system more or less right so what we need to do is we need to get a whole bunch of intelligent academics and put them through navy seal training (laughs) yeah (laughs) and then then, and then we'll actually be okay and i'm not being the least bit facetious this is most exactly what i've been doing with a wide variety of different people Uh, so then the third was that small narrow tiny group of people who Help, were able to perceive the story as it was being told, uh, process their grief and showed up, and then more or less participated in refining the story because what we discovered was that we couldn't do anything about it, but we could try to tell the story better. We could actually get, not by tell the story better, I don't mean merely at the level of narrative, I mean really refine down to rigorous precision uh, a lot of the things that seven years ago was was being pointed at but wasn't being able to be modeled. So like the Archide Smith model came out of that work. And um, some very specific refinements to the painter model, refinements to relationship between complicated and complex. I mean, a lot of work has actually happened from this relatively small group of people right. um, to, to make the story or make the, the science um, more and more precise and more and more simply put. Um, so that's where we are. So, so let's get back to the notion of the mainstream. <clears throat> so here's the, here's the place that I think is like the, the wind that we could really have that would be wonderful. So I'm, I'm a member of Extinction Rebellion, and I am perceiving the imminence of biosphere collapse. And I'm feeling it. And I moved to action. In fact, I moved to action so heavily that I'm willing to do what it takes. So that's, that's move one. <clears throat> Here's the other side of the equation. Um, nothing contained within any of the institutional structures that we currently have could possibly solve the problem. Oh, shit. Because look what happens. I'm willing to do what it takes. But what does that actually show up as? Well, broadly speaking, I'm going to protest and try to get the government to do something. Wow, I've got bad news for you. Even assuming they care, right? So under the capture corruption problem, right? So some some fraction of the folks who are in charge aren't necessarily acting in good faith. But let's assume that we're doing people who are acting in good faith. It ain't it ain't up to the task. The governance structures that we built coming out of World War II are up to the task of getting us to the moon and back. They can't get us to Mars and back. Seems like no chance they can get us to Mars and back. In fact, nowadays they can't get us to the moon and back. <clears throat> they never, ever had the operating capacity to manage the complexity of biosphere collapse. Full stop. It was just not in the cards. And, and they suck compared to where they were in the 70s. So because of the Tainter and the Archidus Smith problems, right, they become very, very complicated. They become, they have entropy all over the place. They're bloated all over the place and they're subject to a fractal defection that makes it almost a, um, a lattice work of fragility. And so here I, <clears throat> I just point to Brexit and I don't mean Brexit in the sense of, oh my gosh, a bunch of people voted to leave, to leave the European Union. I mean, the Heathrow level of incompetence in just processing the question, like even put forward a proposal to muster a vote to get a person to even step into the breach to be able to hold even the least bit of consensus. The the governance system can't handle that question. Can't can't handle. Um, Why do we think that it can handle something that is one times 10 to the 12th more complicated (laughs) 
question of managing biosphere collapse. And when I, when I say that, and I'm, I'm not being facetious because managing biosphere collapse includes Brexit. It includes the European Union. It includes the totality of the entire global economy. It is not just how do we keep uh, you know, the old 1980s, 1990s ecology of how do we save the whales. Right. We're talking about something where it's a big deal. I mean, it's... So you're, awesome you're suggest, I mean, it's a, it's a global ontology and it goes far beyond the old constructs of nation states, for example... You got it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. I mean, it's, 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 it, if we use the computational model as an example, um, you know, it's, it's like trying to I mean, think of something that people are familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, uh, remember downloading with a modem with like an <laughs> old 28, eight modem. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like trying, trying to download every single video on YouTube with a dial-up modem. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, right? I got it's, the point, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not that hard. If you really, really can make it, it's simple. Like The computational capacity of the complicated systems that we have access to right now are roughly equivalent to a dial-up modem in the amount of bandwidth that they can process, at their best, by the way, at their best, and the complexity of the problem domain that we need to deal with is roughly equivalent to every video on YouTube. And okay, that's it. Like if you can really grasp that and understand it and hold it and say, okay, and by the way, check the map. I'm happy. I mean, it's, uh, the point is, is, this, is the asymmetry, not the specifics, but um, then you're able to say, okay, great, Extinction Rebellion, but now I have to really take responsibility all the way down. And, be able to, and to be able to hold the fact that we don't actually know how to solve the problem. Not only that, we don't even know how to, how to build something that knows how to solve the problem. I mean, you're almost talking about, uh, in a sense, trying to close all of these open feedback loops within the global commons. And of course, we do have technology coming online, which allows us, I mean, it's a sort of a very information-rich ecology, which might allow us to begin thinking about how to monitor, report, verify, yeah. responsibility and so on but it's it's very emergent technology and we need to scale it up and i mean it, it's well, here's the here's the very very good news um we haven't actually been idle for the past century and a half um if you imagine a a circle and let's have that circle be the stuff that humanity knows how to do well um and you take a like the way that a root structure like a tree root uh, and project it on that circle. Uh, so what you have is a, a, a kind of a thick center that is very much connected, and then, or if you'd like, uh, a vascular like uh, veins, either one. You've got this um, series that gets narrower and narrower as you get to the edge. Yeah. Okay. That actually is a pretty good representation of what we're currently able to use using the institutional structure that we have. The gaps in between those capillaries of capacity that are currently deployed are actually very, very large. We're probably tapping into something like somewhere between seven and 15% of the potential that currently actually already exists, both in terms of knowledge and in terms of creativity and doing. Um, more or less, we actually know what to do as if we just got our shit. The problem is more about building a new form of collective intelligence that has the capacity to actually deploy something more like 75% of human capacity functionally. Um, we don't actually have to figure out a lot of, of physical stuff. Like we don't have to do a lot of science. We don't have to do a lot of engineering. We do, but most of it's well within the zone of something that we can do or know how to do. The hardest, hardest part is to innovate a new form of how do we go about collaborating doesn't fall into the pitfalls that we just described. And I think you've, you in a way have answered a question which was in the back of my mind, which is it seems as if there's a bit of a paradox here in the sense that we do need institutional apparatus, but we can't put our faith in transcendent institutions. We do need some kind of uh, global response, some kind of infrastructure, but at the same time, 
you know, change has to come from the very local level. I mean, it almost reminds me of, say, what Bertrand Russell said in the late 50s, that so much is at stake and so much rests on the moral constitution of modern man. So it's it's about doing that inner work, which is required by each and every individual. But um, how then to scale it up to a global response to what is a, a global existential risk situation? Yeah, well, there's a couple of rules of thumb that have emerged in the work that we've been engaging in that are at least helpful. Um, one is slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And, and this has to do with the notion of, I mean, think if I can put it, put it uh, the metaphor well so it lands nicely. It's um, you, you can't give birth to a baby any faster than nine months. <laughs> right. more or less certainly not any faster than seven months um there's something about the thing that we're doing where it's really really important to get the basic stuff a lot right um it's kind of like if you're trying to put a spot on the moon with a laser you have to be very precise with where the laser is here on earth and if you try to put a spot on mars it's even more precise well okay that means in the beginning, the, the things that you're doing at the most basic level have to be taken as slowly as they must be taken to make sure the right stuff is laid down well, solid foundations. If you're going to try to build something like what we're talking about, it has to be very precise. It has to be done with um, the level of care that, you know, you remember that you've seen this, the picture of the stones of Machu Picchu? Mm hmm. Yeah. It's like that. And so yes, we are going to be moving 100 ton blocks. They're going to have to actually fit within a millimeter of precision to be able to build the kind of institutional structure that we're talking about. So slow is fast. Slow is smooth. Smooth is fast. And generally speaking, we find ourselves caught in an urgency trap, which is cutting corners because we believe we're running out of time. We are running out of time, but if you if you use the, the, the example of uh, James Bond trying to defuse the bomb, <laughs> if you cut the wrong wire, you've blown up. So even if, you could, even if you, you're, the clock is running out, you really do have to cut the right wire. And so this is important. Super, super, super important. Like in the story that I've told, there's conclusions that follow in terms of choices that can't work and choices that the, the, the places where our choices must be. Um, many people will sort of rush past that and say, well, we've, we've got to solve the problem. And are you, are you familiar with the, uh, the story of Einstein when he was asked, like, how would you solve a really hard problem? No. I would spend, if I had, you know, a day to solve the problem, I would spend 23 hours thinking about the problem very hard <laughs> and then one hour solving it. It's like that. Um, you know, we're doing something that requires that level of, um, like the patience of a neurosurgeon. You're doing something that is very delicate and very precise and errors. We don't have time for errors is a good way of putting it. And so, but yes, how I can, get it. How, how can we know that we're making errors in real time and, and how can we correct that direction? Very nice. Okay, so let's see if we can get it, get something on that. Hmm. Hmm. Well, okay. This is anything, a way of saying this. I don't have a good way of saying it. Uh, the, the principle is actually called a principle of continuity, um, but maybe it'll come up later in the conversation. Let me think of a good example. Whew. Yeah, that's actually super, super hard to say easily. Okay. Well, it, it's going to be something like clarity. Um, so... And, and maybe another good word is integrity. Yeah, this is good. So let me, let me see if this works. There's a, an experience that I think almost everybody has, and our current world reinforces this, of glossing over things, of waving hands or at skipping. Often, oftentimes, actually, even things where you, you have a felt sense that something is awry. So 
let's say that you're like somebody is right. Somebody wrote an email and asked you to check over the email that they're going to send to a third person. And you read through it. And some tiny, tiny portion of you says, mm, but you can't be bothered. It's not too much. So you let it go. Um, it's something like that. It's something like having a, an enormous, such a high level of integrity that you, you don't do anything until you really have clarity. And a high enough level of, of embodied practice of what clarity actually feels like, and this is crucial, um, that you can actually notice when you've got clarity. And this is more like art than it is like science. This is more like complexity than it is like complicatedness. If you, if you imagine a really skilled artist, whether they're playing music or doing sculpture or painting, whatever it happens to be, particularly if you happen to be a really skilled artist, you'll, you'll notice that there is actually a very distinct way of knowing when a particular piece of expression has actually landed. The thing is right. The tone has been hit. Song is correct. Um, and you become, as you become a master of the art, um, you have the ability to master that level of, of clarity of expression that you can feel in yourself all the different ways that you have of perceiving your kinesthetic sense, your spatial sense, your, um, you know, the, the way that you're actually able to model how other human beings will respond to, to uh, manage shame in a social environment, all these different ways that your human instrument is tuned to make sense of its environment are being deployed in harmony with each other to try to get this thing in the right way, in the right place. I'm almost, um, I'm reminded of, say, the Buddhist teaching on right intention to ensure that you have clarity on your intention, to ensure your, in, your intention is ultimately compassionate. Uh, act on that intention, but act without expectation. Yeah, that, that's very nice. Like the, those kinds of, that, that level of embodied ethics, of lived ethics, is actually at the center. This is crucial. So remember I mentioned the thing where we're no longer in a situation where we could be outside of the system? A lot of our intentions would be to try to create, <clears throat> to, to imagine that we could create a control structure. Let's say, like, for example, a mathematical model that we could use to measure the thing that we're doing from the outside. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. Like a, a kind of a steely-eyed new atheist would look at this and say, well, what we're going to do is we're going to need to be able to measure the system that we're designing mm -hmm. to make sure that it's not making any errors. Well, I've got news for you, bucko. <laughs> you're, you're part of the system that you're designing and your control system is also part of the system. There's no outside observer available. Mm. So we're actually talking about something where the interior, you have, you have to think about this as a as way that a dancer dances uh, with a musician plays music, not the way that an engineer designs. Mm. And also, by the way, including the engineer and the scientist and the mathematician inside that dancer, it's an integrated capacity mm. with the totality of all of our, uh, hard earned capabilities as complicated designers are brought to bear, but they're brought to bear in a larger context that brings our capacity to be in integrity as individuals and as a group all the way up and down. Um, that's a very poetic way of putting it. Um, but until I have a better way of putting it, a better about that's about as good as I can do right now. No, that I think that uh, that made a lot of sense, and I suppose as as we draw to a close. Uh, I mean, the idea of integrated capacity is not something that's well understood in the academy at the moment. Uh, you know, myself, many of my colleagues, we're very specialized within our own disciplinary silos. And I yeah, think yeah, that's good. So, so thank you. That's, that's, a, that's a good opening. So let's use this as a very, very nice concrete example. And I, and I witnessed this at the Santa Fe Institute, so I can speak to it quite clearly. Um, imagine if scientists, academics, were upgraded in their capacity in three ways. First, they went through Navy SEAL training. So their limbic system didn't jack their uh, prefrontal cortex. They could actually deal with, with, with things that felt bad and still actually stay very, very clear. Right, so that's one. Uh, the second 
is they really seriously went through a Buddhist training so they could actually act in a non-egoic, non-attached way. So that truly, I mean, imagine that. Imagine if you had a group of scientists who, without losing even an iota of their acumen or expertise, upgraded their uh, neuro-emotional capacity and upgraded their ability to, to, to interact with each other non-egoically. Um, and then they began to collaborate on constructing better frameworks than they're holding as individuals in a truly t- transdisciplinary way. Right? Imagine what they could do that is currently utterly impossible in the context of scientists who have the emotional resilience of baby deer, have the <laughs> egos of, I guess, scientists. I don't really have anything more superlative than that. Um, and who, as a consequence, are unreasonably wedded to the cognitive frameworks that are useful tools that are definitely not the whole story. Um, that's actually not a bad way of, of sort of beginning the journey. Now, of course, just extend that to include everybody, and you're getting a, 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 the beginning of the how. Mm. But of course, in particular, young young people, students, school children, uh, they need to be, have that capacity to perceive the world in a much more sophisticated and in- integrated fashion. And I suppose we all have a role to play there. And 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 by the way, I guess we've got just a few more minutes. Um, yeah, five is perfect. Um, my my experience of of education, the educational system, is that. It's almost entirely, not just a waste, but destructive. Uh, So we've got a lot of room to maneuver. (laughs) Uh, The amount of time that young people are putting into learning stuff that not only does not serve them, but actually gets in the way of things that would serve them, could be put to better better ends. And so I would imagine, for example, that you could create a different educational regime that where young people could learn the things they need to learn. I'm quite confident that you could get a PhD level of academic capacity uh, somewhere around your sophomore level of high school if you were actually in a place that wasn't wasting your time. If, by the way, that that was your calling, it very well may not be, but just at at the level of sort of the amount of knowledge or more importantly, the capacity to learn more, much more to the point. Uh, And also be able to develop these other capacities at the level of emotion and ego. So, a pivot, a pivot in an educational domain where we focused on kids ages, say, 14 to 22, and just use their time well to, to build the capacity to learn up to a much, sharp, much, much sharper level. And again, from my point of view, that's actually trivial because the current system is oper- operating the exact opposite direction. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, you, and use the time savings to simultaneously upgrade their... Um, emotional, physical capacities, um, their self-awareness, mindfulness, egoic capacities. And while we're at it, their relational capacities so they can become really good friends and mates to each other. Um, This would be like, that's extremely doable. And it's like the pointy end of the spear in terms of getting things done. Um, And they're smart. Kids these days can grab, can move fast. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think you've certainly given me some homework. I'll have to sign up for that SEAL training. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and I, I was just curious to ask Jordan, I mean, would you have any particular readings that you would suggest for my students, uh, undergraduates, graduates? Uh, <laughs> well, it's funny. Yeah. My, my sense, my sense is they've been reading too damn much. <laughs> Almost yeah. certainly. Reading is getting in the way. I would recommend uh, boxing. Um, mm-hmm. I would definitely recommend a course of getting punched in the face until you're no longer worried about getting punched in the face. Then think about what it is you might want to read. Mm. Um, mm. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you so much. I really have enjoyed uh, engaging with you in person. I've been following your your writing and, and your YouTube videos and um, goodness, it's, it's really been very stimulating and inspirational for me. Uh, where can we find more on your current thinking are you are you still blogging or no i am i am entirely focused on the on the project in a sort of practical sense like the theory is more or less done and uh-huh. while 
you know, when good people like yourself come and ask questions, I am willing to share, but I'm not engaging in any action on my part to produce broadcast material. Mm -hmm. Um, Perhaps at some point in the future that will turn back on, but at least now, um, almost all of my time is spent actually collaborating on trying to figure out how to um, really deliver on that new form of collective intelligence, that new form of collaboration. Mm-hmm. Well, Godspeed in that Thank work, you. Jordan. And I hope that we will have an opportunity to continue this conversation at some point. And really, it's been a real pleasure. Beautiful. It's been a pleasure for me as well. And I'm really delighted by how much ground we were able to cover in this time. Thanks for tuning into Imperfect Utopias. To get access to all of our content and to stay up to date with future Zoom calls, workshops and events and more, check us out at ucl.ac.uk forward slash global dash governance. If you like this content, please do leave us a comment and subscribe. Till next time.